My name is Michael Gaia, publisher of the Lead Lag Report. Join me for the hour with a man known as Rudy Havenstein. And I know that's not your real name, obviously, Rudy. But <laughs> introduce yourself to the audience to the extent you're comfortable. Who are you? What's your background? How'd you get interested involved in financial markets? And uh, why Rudy? Uh, I'd like to welcome all the 81 million followers who are, who are here today. I, I was thinking, I don't know, I'm a, an artist and a historian, and uh, I've always had an interest in uh, financial markets and came on Twitter in 2013 as Rudy Havenstein, because probably at the time I was concerned, I still am, that we're going down a path that leads to, you know, bad things historically. And and so, you know, I try to have some fun and inform people about what's going on. So I don't think a lot of people really do understand what's going on as far as, especially the Federal Reserve and, and how they operate and how that affects 330 million Americans. So, you know, just uh, Twitter's a good way to do it. Now I'm on Substack too for more long form stuff. And, and glad to be here. I listen to you, a lot of your podcasts and enjoy them. You have a lot of great guests. So I don't know why I'm invited on, but it's nice to be here. Thank you very much. Okay, so, so let's go into the character of Rudy Havenstein, not the right. character, the actual person. First of all, why use as your handle? Because I think even, you know, until recently, you know, for ever since 08, every economist on earth has been saying every day, we need more inflation. And to me, that's every time I hear that, I'm like, what are you talking about? We need more inflation. Now, I, I do, I'm not, I've read, an, I understand why they want more inflation, but you go to tell if you took every example of the word inflation and replaced it with your cost of living to go up, I mean, that's basically what they're saying. And, and there's a lot of people who, first of all, don't pay any attention to the markets at all. There's a lot of people who don't know who Janet Yellen is or Ben Bernanke or Jay Powell. And we forget that, I think, sometimes on here. But um, So anyway, that was you know, uh, the, one of the most famous examples of, uh, of fiat money getting out of control was 1923. With Rudy Hammerstein was the head of the Central Bank of Germany, the Reichsbank. And they printed too much money and they got hyperinflation, which I think I have a lot of posts on this, including on Substack. I think that led to the rise of Hitler directly. I think it destroyed Germany. It destroyed their morale, their morality. And they were looking for a savior and they got this guy, you know, the beer hall push was in 1923 and Hitler, you know, came to power in 33. And I mean, it's an extreme example of a cool looking character too. You know, the, the mustache and the era. I'm always interested in that era of World War I, World War II. I think not World War I specifically because I, that directly led to the rise of Hitler in World War II. So, and you know, you see it today in Venezuela or you'll see it in Argentina to a less, you know, hopefully they won't go this, you know, same extremes as Germany, but inflation is very bad for, I think, I've shown, and I think you ask most people for like 90% of the people, you know, the top 10%, 90% of stock. So it's good for them. But every day, all the people in charge that, you know, lately it's the Krugmans and the Wolfers and the Bernankes and uh, until recently Powell, you know, basically saying we need more inflation every day. And I think it's insulting to people. I've been tweeting about it for years and I've been a voice crying in the wilderness. It's bad. And I mean, I have countless examples. I retweet them of, you know, all of our FOMC members calling for much higher inflation. You know, three, now the latest thing is people like, you know, Cantillon effect beneficiaries like Mohammed El Arian. Oh, maybe you need 4% inflation, 3% target. And you got the same thing with a lot of billionaires like Barry Sternlicht, who's, you know, worried that his, he won't be able to charge you 20% rent bumps every year. And he's concerned about it. Well, you know, why don't we raise the, the target to 2%, 2% to 4%? You know, that wouldn't be so bad. Well, yeah, if you're worth $4 billion or $5 billion, it's not so bad. If you're a Krugman and you've got a cost of living adjusted pensions and all, you know, I did some posts yesterday, you know, 20 years ago, he made in one speaking fee, then the average, then half of Americans make in a year. So these guys are clueless and we have to listen to Justin Wolfers and we have to listen to Paul Krugman. It's just insulting. I hear these guys all the time and go ask your average neighbor, go ask your neighbor, hey, do you want your cost of living to go up? Well, that's what inflation is and that's what they're promoting and that's what they want. And I understand why. Anyway. That's why I picked Rudy Havenstein, because that was an extreme example. And I like doing a little satire and parody. And that was good to, you know, riff off of. I'm curious, just a little bit as far as your own background. I don't get the sense, maybe I'm wrong, you know, necessarily worked on Wall Street. What, no. what are some of the things you've done throughout your career? No, not at all. I was in the, I was in the software business back uh, during the bubble before the last bubble. So back you know, in the 80s and 90s. And, and before that, you know, I just grew up. One income household, mom took care of the kids, dad was a teacher. And I remember the inflation of the 60s and 70s. And I remember what, how it affected my dad and my mom and my family. And, you know, we, never, we weren't poor, we never starved, but we sure as hell ate a lot of, you know, on sale 
you know, hamburger helper. You know, I mean, and my dad took a second job to try and pay the bills and, and he was able to do it. But, uh, you know, house prices back then were, you know, one f- tenth as much or so, one fifth as much, you know, I'm in a very high cost of living area, you know, so I don't know. I just feel for the young people today that can't buy a house. When I grew up, I never thought I wouldn't be able to grow a house, uh, buy a house <laughs> or grow a house. But nowadays I see a lot of young people that are like, well, I'm never going to own a house. And to me, that's, that affects everything that affects family formation and it affects people buying furniture. And it's, I mean, it's just not good. And everything this government's done and the Fed's done in the last this century has been to try and keep house prices, for example, and rents higher than they would otherwise be. And I think that's bad for society. I mean, it's good for Barry Starluck. It's good for Larry Fink or it's good for Steve Schwarzman. It's bad for most, 300 million Americans, I think. I hear people, you know, people that know me, I mean, they talk about, you know, rent, oh, rent deflation, the threat of rent deflation. I'm like, well, what? Normal people do not think like our leaders or our economists in particular. Econom- academic economists do not think like the guy at the supermarket. And that's a problem because somehow we've given these jokers way too much power, including the Fed. Let's tease that out because I think that's, that's an interesting direction to go. So with the idea of, you know, they're not thinking like the average person uh, in policy, right? So- right. And l- let me just say that to, to get, answer your question more. Um, I, my parents never owned stocks. They didn't have any stocks. He, dad, he has a minor, he had a minor pension because he was a teacher. I was always interested in the stock market for some reason. I always had a job since grade school. So I always had a little bit of money and never got any money from my parents. And, uh, and I was just fascinated by the stock market. And so that's why I've studied so much and then related things like psychology or hi- financial history. Scams, you know, I've, that's another area that interests me, frauds and scams, because of course there's a lot of that going on. And anyway, so I was, that's why I talk sometimes like a financial guy, but I think it's a huge advantage that I didn't come out of that background of Wall Street, because I think I see things a little differently. And I think people like that. So there you go. Yeah. And, I, you, and obviously you've, you've built a, a very large following on that. You also been blocked a lot, which I want to think of, of, of X, which sure. I want to talk about. But the, okay. So, so. Uh, let, let's play it out. So the policymakers, they got all these models. Obviously, all they're doing is creating more and more inflation. They never allow the system to cleanse itself. It's easy for a lot of people to attack policymakers, central banks, Federal Reserve. But it's, it, you know, arguably the world is complex, right? And aside sure. from there being different incentives, I, I can make an argument that the best thing the Fed can do to solve inflation actually may be to lower rates. Because if you lower rates, it might cost more competition. Competition maybe solves inflation. My point is there's always complicating sort of secondary tertiary effects, Mm -hmm. right, in terms of what policymakers do. So, you know, if I forget who it was from, I think, Greek or Roman times, right, it was like a farmer who came in and was asked to be either a military general, a dictator, whatever, something like that to kind of save Rome. Somebody who was like a very standard person just solving things. If somebody were, if you were going to have a policymaker at the head of the Federal Reserve who is like the average American, what do you think they would do? Well, here's the first thing I would say. Stop the QE. I mean, and I know everyone, you know, I just, that was, that to me is just outrageous. We're already at, we're back. They've taken rates to five, over 5%, which if you look historically, and by historically, I go back to the data they have on FRED, which is a pretty good site for this kind of stuff. Although I'm going to argue later that the data distorted, definitely distorted. But, you know, we're at about average rates of, for the last 60 years or so. Okay. Now, people, we're not at average rates with this kind of debt. I understand that, but I'm just saying we're not at, extreme rates at 5%. And same thing with mortgage rates. We're back to long-term averages. But this QT, which is still well over 8 trillion, the big thing is they need to get rid of that because that's where a lot of the wealth, the Cantillon effect wealth inequality came from. And if you don't believe me, I've got some posts, great quotes from people like Drucker Miller and, and all sorts of other market guys that basically say the same thing. Steve Eisman says it's, it's, it's mon- mon- QE is monetary policy for rich people. And Kirillov calls it the socialism for the 1%. That's what QE is. And they did, you know, 8 trillion of it after, you know, 2008. And that's one of the reasons that we have the inflation problem we have right now. But we always have an inflation problem. That's been my point, too. We always, there's always inflation. It's what degree of rate of change are we arguing about? Lately, it's been higher than we were used to, but there's always, you know, inflation. The QT is important to me because they had zero MBS, mortgage-backed securities, in 2008. They owned none. Then they bought a couple trillion be- to save the world or to save somebody's world. That's what I was, you know, it's like, oh, they saved the world. Without that, we would, you know, well, whose world? Because there's a lot of people still, I think, in a depression since 2008. So they say, yeah, I mean, they, Lloyd Blank finds a billionaire today because they saved him, for sure. But 
the MBS to me, I, you, you can, we can debate the treasury is fine. They're a central bank, whatever. It's, although that's going to be a problem too, if you're monetizing your debt. But anyway, the MBS is inexcusable to me. What they did in 2020, and this is when house prices were already going up year over year. They just poured in two months, they bought 500 billion of mortgage backed securities. I mean, it's not, you know, they just poured a couple trillion dollars. Their runoff of that is very minor. And you don't, I mean, I think that f- threw f- uh, gasoline on an already distorted housing market. And it's inexcusable because the Cantillon effect means the, pe- the only people that 0% rates help are people with a lot of assets who have collateral to borrow and buy more assets. And that's what happened. You know, that for me, if I'm head of the Fed tomorrow, I'm going to start selling that, selling off that balance sheet. Now, I understand that's going to cause problems here and there. Well, we've already proven over the last 15 years that there is no limit, as Kaskari said, there is no limit to the money printing. Okay. So let's put out fires, not to say, let the hedge, I mean, let the hedge funds go under, let the, let some of the banks go under. FDIC is very good at that, but we don't have to keep feeling this Cantillon effect that is, is widening the wealth disparity in this country to a point where it's ridiculous. And as I pointed out before, the, the top 1% is a 45 degree angle up and to the right. And the, and the 50 to 90% is 45 degree angle down. And that's fed data. And to me, it's, and no one ever talks about any of this. Yeah. I mean, arguably, you know, austerity is the best thing that can happen to any indebted country, just the bloating, right? Of, well, well that's I, enabled by central bank policies. Yeah. I don't know about austerity. I mean, austerity, maybe more, a little more austerity on the top 10%. You know, I mean, we, until it seems like the policy the last 15 years is the number one goal of the Fed has been neither inflation nor unemployment, but stock market, you know, but, you know, and, and frankly, I'm surprised that they got this high and the market hasn't tanked yet. But I guess, you know, there's a lot of things going on that are new now. The passive flows are a big thing. And anyway, I just, yeah, I, I think that the blowing up of the balance sheet was a, was a big factor in the inequality that's grown in this country. I, I think it's a huge factor. That's why I do this, because that's why people are getting more and more angry. And I have a number of posts on this. I mean, I, this is a 10 year, I've been doing this for 10 years on here and many years before. So, we just got to stop fueling the Cantillon effect dispersion of wealth in this country. It's a big transfer up. And then they get us mad at each other over, you know, social issues to distract us. And I really think that's true. Wars are always for the people that make a lot of money off them. I just look it up as, we're, as you're chatting. The, the person I was referencing was humble Cincinnatus, a Roman statesman, a simple farmer turned general, then dictator Rome, who was revered for his humility, his legend would have to give all that power to return home which it feels like you need some character like that in, in power now. Okay, so, so with you on all this, my question to you is, why do you do it, right? So obviously, you, know, you, you enjoy, right, as I do, right, kind of pointing out hypocrisy and, and the ridiculousness of the current environment we're in, but, but what's in it for you as somebody who it sounds like you had a good career, yeah, have a family, have a good life? Yeah. Why go through the, the cesspool of getting into your, and pointing some of this stuff out? Well, since the 90s, I was surprised as I talked to Co- or very well educated people, you know, I say, oh, weird what's going on with the, yeah. everyone. Well, I guess the big thing was when they started with the dot com bubble, because then everybody and their mother really got into stocks. And people who didn't know what a stock was, you know, a day before were suddenly buying, you know, the pets.com type things of the world. And I thought that was interesting. So I started doing like emails to friends of things that I found interesting in the financial markets mostly. And I'd send those out and same thing as with the, and then that all crashed, of course. And a lot of, I have a lot of friends that lost like all their money because they were told, I was told by guys from Goldman Sachs and Pricewaterhouse back then, smart guys that a friend had arranged for some reason for me to meet. And they said, they looked at my portfolio, which is always very bizarre and undiversified. And they said, hey, this is insane. This is like 19, you know, 99. This is insane. You should be 100% in high tech growth stocks. And I said, ah, okay, I'm happy with what I got, you know, and, and sure enough, the next six months, the NASDAQ went up, you know, 80%, you know, and then it crashed and went down like 90%. I mean, a lot of people lost 90% of their stocks because they buy all the stupid stuff that goes to the moon. And then nobody, most people aren't traders like on halftime reports. They're not buying bottoms and selling tops like all the Fintwig guys do. They're getting there. They're buying at the top, but they're getting out panicking at the bottom and they lose their ass. So. I saw that. And then the housing bubble. Oh my God. We just barely get through the dot com. So all these people that there are a few that were left, they start getting into the, you know, the housing. And it's funny because, you know, what was it? 2004? Krugman has been in the, in my mind, 
uh, lately. He's, he was telling, you know, him and Paul McCauley, you know, another Cantillon effect guy says, oh, you know, Greenspan needs to create another bubble. We need another bubble. I mean, this is what he wrote in the New York Times, Krugman. We need another bubble to replace the dot-com bubble. And we got it. We got the housing bubble. And then when that crashed, that was bad. So I'm, as in the lead up to that, I'm talking to realtors, I'm talking to people, I'm reading all this stuff and it's all from like ground up stuff, like what Melody Wright's doing now or Amy. And they didn't know, no, they, they didn't know about it. I talked to realtors in like 2006, seven, and I'm talking, God, do you know about all these first payment defaults going on, all these foreclosures? And, and they're all like looking at me like I got two heads. No, the market's fantastic. It's never going to go down. Well, it went down. And in some places like Phoenix, you know, the usual suspects of sand states, it went down quite a bit. And so I'm putting all this in my emails and, you know, some people, you get a range of responses. You get, I don't want to know. You hear a lot. I don't want to know. I don't care. It's another response. A lot of people don't want to believe, you know, data that, you know, they don't want to believe. So anyway, I was just trying to educate people. And especially on the Federal Reserve after the late nineties, I realized how big a factor they are. And, and that's it. Why? Because I have kids and grandkids and I care about this country and I've I really believe that the wealth inequality is driving people to extremism. And I think the way that 2008 was handled was horrific. And I think it, it left a permanent mark on America. Not Paul Krugman. He's fine. Not Lloyd Blank. Fine. You know, not the people on CNBC because they all did great and their friends all did great. And, pr- and many of them made a boatload of money. But your average American, I think, was really disillusioned back then. And that's not good because if you've got nothing You know, you got nothing to lose, like Dylan said, you know, and people have lost faith. They used to think in this country, a lot of people never really bashed rich people in America because they thought, oh, I'm going to be rich someday, so I don't want to do that. But now there's a lot of people that are like, I'm never going to be rich. I'm never going to own a house. I don't have a chance. And it's a shame. I hate to see that. It's very, you know, young kids, you know, we anyway younger than me as a kid, but, you know, 30 year olds or whatever, they can't, they're never going to have a house. And they're in a little apartment where they're paying four grand a month you know, or a, it bothers. Me. Yeah. So I do it because I have the time to do it as I, cause I read, I'm, I'm watching the market every day. I, I'm not a trader, but I, I do a lot of investing, you know, in and out and I enjoy it. And so it's a fun thing I started doing on Twitter in 2013, which is an extension of what I'd been doing all along in my emails to people. Um, just trying to inform people and have some fun. By the way, that, I'd argue there's a strong correlation between losing hope and spending on experiences. Right, which is like what the younger generation is, Yolo. is more fan of, right? They just right, and Yolo and just go out to concerts, and it's more about experience as opposed to buying things. Right, it's, it's, it's got yeah. a relation there. Well, there's no hope for the future, so they don't save for it or plan for it. You know, that's that's terrible. That's not good for society. You know, I'd rather Lloyd Blank find not be a billionaire, and maybe my house be worth less, and not and have society not be destroyed. Like somebody years ago, like I was, you know, I'm not a gold bug, but I like gold. I think everybody should own a little gold, maybe or. But I, I, somebody goes, well, yeah, gold's going to go to 10000 or so. I said, I don't want that. I don't want, I want gold to be like $500 and have us deal with our problems. But we don't. We just double down. I tweeted in March 2020, you know, the sound you hear right now is the Gini ratio spiking up. And that's exactly what happened. And, you know, we saved, the, you know, the banksters last time. And, and in 2020, we saved Jeff Bezos and their hedge fund managers. You know, Bill Ackman, he's crying on CNBC. And two weeks later, there's an article, Bill Ackman made $2.6 billion, you know, trading the COVID bounce. You know, why do we keep bailing these people out? I mean, most Americans, by the way, don't own stocks. You know, a lot of people don't realize that because they don't want to fit to it. Like, oh yeah, I'm, you know, but I guess I see, I watch CNBC. I mean, I had CNBC on in the night, CNBC on in the nineties, you know, at work. And it's gotten so much worse. All the worst people rose to the top. I'm, I'm afraid to say, sorry to say, but you know, most people don't live in that world. You know, I, I do. And I know people who do, but I know people who don't live in that world. And it's, and that's what I care about. I care about this country. I love this country. A lot of people are dying to come to this country. You know, I mean, look at all the people trying to leave in there, you know, going thousands of miles and enduring all sorts of hardships to try and get in here. So they see a future and, but a lot of immigrants see a future. And, but a lot of, the, I think the people that grew up here and saw their parents lose their house in LA, they don't see that. Everybody, please make sure you follow Rudy here on X. If you want to come up and ask questions, click that bottom left mic request button. And as always, this will be a podcast under Lead Lag Live on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube. By the way, I sympathize with a lot of what you're saying. I mean, you know, I was born here. My parents immigrated from Egypt. Mm-hmm. And I've all had a discussion with my own mother, you know, long after my father passed, that had my father who came to this country with, you know, 
he owed money, right? He was one of those stories mm-hmm. where he was $200 in the red and, and built a, a name and life here. That if he were to do that all over again today, he probably would not have had the success he had, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, the number of years down the line. So it is true that the appeal of America is, and the idea that America is the land of opportunity is just not there anymore. Now you alluded to a little bit well, earlier, right? Well, no, I think it is. I think it is. I mean, but it's, it isn't for a lot, for a growing number of people. And that's a problem. So that's my point. I'm not like saying there's no hope anymore. A lot of people go from nothing, make something of themselves. What I pointed out years ago is I'm not rich bashing. I, I'm talking about government created, you know, billionaires and multi-gazillionaires. So that's what I'm talking about. I mean, you know, the pizza guy down, the, the guy that owns a pizza place down the street does not get the deals that, you know, Barry Spore, Lloyd Blankfein, or, you know, J- Jamie Dimon. And that, bo- that, that bothers me. I understand politics and donations and, you know, this is it's really nothing new, but it's the blatant, the blatancy of it is just off the charts lately and, and growing. How do you think we get shocked out of the apathy there? Because I think you alluded to it, and this is where it gets to be really challenging, right? People are too worried about their day-to-day life, think about all this other stuff that's impacting their day-to-day lives. It's hard to get people to mobilize, right, in terms of their understanding of financial markets and policymakers to want to vote for the right actions being taken, not just those that want to give more stimmies. How do you even change the mindset of the public when they're just largely head in the sand and too busy just trying to somewhat breathe? Ed- educate, try and show them. I t- always, tr- I, I think I, I'm actually a little bit encouraged. I see way more people that seem to be in on the scam, even on FinTwit. And I think that that's what I've been trying to do for years. And I, when I say something, I mean, I always have links. I always have charts. I'm always back in I, what I say. And to me, it's, I try and use the simplest examples of just to show people in a, fo- in a graph, in a chart, look what's happening. You know, look, I say, look at the results. Don't listen to the narrative. Oh, the Fed, you know, what does the Fed do? Well, the Fed's purpose is to stabilize the, you know, the United States economy and be the lender less resort. And blah, it has too many. You know, great. That's all very nice. It's all propaganda. All propaganda now. You know, I, I really think so much of it is, you know, the Fed minutes, every Fed speaker. I mean, we have weeks where we have 10 Fed speakers going out. What, what is that all about? You know, it's nothing but propaganda. And so I think it, I'm encouraged. I think education, I'm trying to do it here. People do it different, you know. Some people protest, some people write letters. This is, what, this is what I do. And if it makes a minor difference, that's fine. You know, I don't have any hope, you know, of, I, I, I'm not delusional. I, you know, I, the Fed's going to be around for my lifetime because Congress is so corrupt. That's ultimately where the problem is. And I have people like, why do you bash the Fed? It's Congress. And you're right. Congress is, but the reason I went after the Fed more than Congress is because every, there's a ton of people that are, you know, pointing out Congress. And Congress is easier to understand, but the mechanism by which the Fed transfers wealth upwards is a little more complicated. And fortunately, we've got great guys like Chris Leonard wrote a book, a great book called The Lords of Easy Money. Ed Chancellor wrote a book just out called The Price of Time, and then explain the mechanism of how they're transferring wealth up. And it's got to be intentional at this point because, you know, Democrat, Republican, it doesn't matter. And, and by the way, that's another thing that I think has been my advantage over the years. I, I love both parties. I have no, you know, I can count on one hand the number of Congress people I probably have respect for. So I think you just vote them all out. I mean, you got to vote in people that are going to, that identify with the middle class less than they identify with, you know, the Jamie Diamonds of the world. And I understand that's, it takes a billion dollars to be president nowadays or something. I mean, you know, the money's just insane, but we got to start somewhere. And I hear a lot from people, oh, voting doesn't matter. We're not even going to have an election and stuff like that. I hate to hear that kind of talk. You know, I, that's not what, I'm not like that. I'm not a doomer gloomer, but I'm not, I'm a kind of a realist too. So I don't know what's going to happen, but we need to get rid of all these incumbents. I mean, you have people like McConnell and Pelosi been in Congress since the mid eighties. And what have they done other than enrich themselves? I don't know much, you know, some centurions of debt for what? Where's our Hoover Dam? Anyway, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I, I love it. I'm, I've, <laughs> both parties absolutely suck. I mean, there's, and, and yeah. no matter what party's in power, debt always goes up. It does, it's just about where the spending goes, which is the ultimate real problem, but at least in my view. Let's get into the name of the space, the inflation data lies. Yes. Everyone always correctly notes that official inflation data is not real inflation. It's real inflation is actually that higher. And of course, there's a lot of nuances there, right? Inflation yeah. in New York can be very different than inflation in the middle of the country or in Correct. California, or, right? right? And by zip code, even in the same state, which is why like even the inflation discussion to me is is very, it's so much more nuanced than what the Fed presents and what Congress presents, right, to the American yeah. public. Let's tease that out. How should one think about what the real rate of inflation is that you, it's, we you know, it tells me about what you need, not versus what you want. Well, yeah, I mean, clearly 
you know, the inflation for a single guy living in New York is very different from a family living in, you know, California with four kids or something like that. It's, but the, but you said everyone knows that everyone says that inflation is, you know, understated or whatever. That's that, I think that's the extremist view. That's my view. I think most people that I see in financial media, which by the way is abysmal, say it's like a number. If they come out with 3.7%, that's gospel. It's that's 3.7% across 330 million Americans. And, and then, they'll, you know, the market will rally, you know, a thousand points because it wasn't 3.8% as if that matters. It's all, again, it's all propaganda, I think. I mean, just look, as I pointed out many times, great example is you can go and um, look at the Federal Reserve website. Most of their inflation numbers come from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, BLS. And they have series like, you know, you know, what are the price of, you know, what's the inflation CPI of staplers over time? Or So if you go to new cars and used cars, You'll notice that there's a period, if you do the chart, not of the rate of change, but of the actual of prices, 1995 and a couple of years ago, new car prices and used car prices basically for 25 years went nowhere, did not go up at all, according to the BLS. And that's what goes in CPI. So for 25 years, we had zero inflation in car prices. There's a great video of Kyle Bass explaining this. I'm not sure if he's using the exact same time frame, but I think he is. And he said, we had a 300% increase in car prices in the real world, in the world we have to live in with our wallets. And he said, according to Kyle, 5% was the bump in the CPI. Okay. So people are like, what are you talking about? How does that work? Well, most people think, you know, if a car is $10,000 this year and it's $11,000 next year, that's a 10%, you know, increase in the Price of on say that's the average. Well, no, because the the thousand dollar increase. Well, actually, you know the brakes are better, and there's a couple extra airbags. So actually, if you had to pay for those separately, that would be fifteen hundred dollars. So actually, the price of the car fell five hundred dollars, and you actually have five uh, percent deflation in the price of cars. And if you look on there of car prices from ninety five on, you'll see there were years where it went down, and of course. You go to the dealer's lot and you bring that chart with you and you go, hey, I understand car prices are down this year by percent or, and they'll look at you like you got two heads, you know? It's so like I say, take a chart of, you know, inflation expectations and bring it to your supermarket and get the discount. You know, it's nonsense. But that's, they do hedonics in everything. They do it in men's shirts. They give an example where a cotton shirt is worth 25% more than a polyester shirt and a long sleeve shirt is 15% more than a short sleeve shirt. And these are completely subjective numbers. They pull out of their the air, just like the 2% target. There is no 2% target. Their legal authority is stable prices. So this whole talk of going to 3 and 4%, I mean, I wish, but again, there's no one in Congress. There's no Ron Paul anymore to, to call him on this. So hedonics is a huge problem because things that go up in price are in the CPI is going down in price. And that's a part of the reason you got guys like Krugman saying, well, gosh, you know, everything's so super. I look at my data here that my secretary brings me and it's all wonderful. So why are people, you know, kind of bummed out? And, and it's because they live in the real world, Paul, and you don't. The other things they do, they do the weightings. Now, I haven't checked lately, but I three years ago, or no, yeah, probably more like four years ago now, I checked the weightings that the BLS uses, right? And I found my biggest expense right now is, and I'm self-employed, so it's the health insurance. And that had a 1.25% weighting in the CPI in 2019. So, okay, in my case, now I understand other people, their employer pays their self insurance, their health insurance is no big, it's zero for them. But for me, my number one expense, and it's one and a quarter percent in the CPI. So, you know, of course, that's a joke. And they don't even measure, by the way, you think, okay, they'll take the average price of health insurance, right? Well, it's too complicated to do that. So they use some sort of weird retained earnings method. You can go Google it on the BLS site. It's bizarre. It has nothing to do with the price I'm paying for health insurance. The other thing they do is substitution. You know, the old, you know, you, hamburgers got too expensive, so you switch to hot dogs. Well, in the real world, people are like, I can't afford hamburger anymore. I got to buy these crummy hot dogs that are, they, you know, they've gone up too. But it's just, it, it's a game they play. And the people on TV speak about the CPIs of its gospel. And it's not, has no relation really in a lot of ways to the way people in the real world, because your income isn't hedonically adjusted higher. And you have to write a check based on the non-hedonically adjusted price of a car. So this never occurs to people like Justin Wolfers, because I think their brains are so rotted from being in academia for so long, particularly ec economics, which 
it seems to have a high correlation of people with brain damage. This is insulting. Go talk to, I always tell people, go, there's no inflation. We need more inflation. Go talk, go down to a bar and say that. You know, I need your cost of living to go higher and see how that goes over. By the way, it, it, is, it is amazing because back to what you said in the beginning, in the 60s and 70s, you, you had mentioned, you know, one income household, right? It's like now you've yeah. got you know, two income households, even three income households, and still most people have a hard time. You know, I, I will, I'll post it, I'll repost it. Elizabeth Warren, who I personally don't care for now, I think she's a poser, but she, in, in 2010, maybe, they had those FCIC, Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission interviews, which... If you're ever bored and looking for a podcast, go there. She, listen to hers. And she talked, this is before she became a, you know, identity politics goofball. But she was actually talking about how the inflation of the 1970s affected families and how one income had to become two. And they, and even that wasn't enough. So people started to get into credit card debt. I mean, I remember, you know, you know, 40 years ago, people didn't have the credit card debt and that's all new. And I think it's, I think there's a line from the big short was like, how do you make poor feel good, you know, and you give them cheap debt? Well, it's not cheap debt. That's the thing too. People, you know, oh, during the zero interest rate. Well, yeah, BlackRock could borrow at 0%. But even back then, two years ago, people with credit cards are paying 17%. Now it's 25 or something, but they never, there was no, there was never any 0% rate for people without assets. And a lot of people have no assets. So a little bit earlier, you had mentioned gold. And I love the way you framed it. It's like, you'd rather be at 500 with, with problems yeah. fixed, right? I, I'm curious because you know, a lot of what you're saying, I think, would resonate to, let's call them the Bitcoin maxis. Yeah. Right? Um, I, I haven't seen, I mean, Tom, I may have just missed it, but any thoughts on Bitcoin, the same sort of way of thinking about the current environment and that as maybe a fix? Yeah, I found a lot of common ground with the Bitcoin people. I'm not a crypto guy or Bitcoin guy per se. I own a very small amount of Bitcoin in case it goes to a billion dollars. I got, but there's a lot of common ground and that's something that's important to me, common ground, whether, and a lot of the Bitcoin guys get the problem with the fiat currency. I mean, before 1971, people didn't say adjusted for inflation. You know what I mean? It's a problem and it's a problem for the poorest people. I mean, if we have 40, I mean, I've heard smart guys say we need, you know, four, a few years of, you know, 40% inflation or something like that. It's like, dude, you think you got social issues now? I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, look, and that's why I keep going back to Germany because it destroyed the society. And the cap, the big city capitalists came out fine. I've got, I love contemporary quotes from that era because they're consistent. It was really bad for the vast majority of people, but for the very wealthy, it actually turned out really good. So there are winners and losers. One of my recurring themes, we, we've constantly chosen the winners to be the top 1.1%. And I, I think we should try and get away from that. Gold, my opinion on gold is gold is a handgun you keep in your drawer and hope you never need. It's an insurance policy. And Bitcoin, I am not a, you know, I sometimes they try and convert me to be a maximalist or something. And I'm like, no, man, you do you, I do me. You know, God bless you. But we do have a lot of common ground, particularly on our understanding of how the Fed and the fiat money is, is really hurting people. And for a lot of people, like, you know, I can see Bitcoin, if you're in a foreign country, your currency's hyper inflating. I mean, Bitcoin is definitely, you know, it only has a 10 year track record, but it's saved a lot of people's lives, I think, over there in other countries, especially. But me, I'm I, I, I common ground. I like to find that in politics too. Like, I don't mind if I don't, if I disagree with you on 90% issues, but if you agree with me on anti-war, for example, I'll, I'll retweet you, even though I may hate, you know, some of your other takes, but that's okay. Same thing with me. People identify with me and then they, on my crazy stuff, they just, you know, they ignore it. Well, you know what I mean? You, you talk very eloquently, obviously you're very intelligent and there's nothing that you've said that I think anybody would disagree with, but yet I get the sense that some people see your account and they think you're either an extremist or a little bit kind of off your rocker, right? Yeah. And obviously, I don't, it's, but, and, and it's, it's no different than with me. Like for me, it's a persona. I've said this many times when it comes to X. I'm loud on purpose. It gets engagement. What is it about just your content that you think gets people, rough people the wrong way? I'm just curious. I mean, well, it, it, I don't think they're used to being challenged. I mean, who else? You know, I said years ago when every, you know, like 2016, 20 or 2017 after Trump won, every late night comedian, Saturday Night Live, everybody. The entire show was Trump jokes. And I said, it was like six years ago, I said, yeah, okay, there's nothing wrong with making a Trump joke. I was never a Trump fan, but all your jokes are Trump jokes, all, you know, for an hour and a half, it's all, you know, Trump's an idiot. I mean, how hard is that to do? It's the easiest thing in the world. Make a Janet Yellen joke, right? Which I've been doing for years here. You, you know, you'll get booed. People are shocked. People are shocked. Greenspan gets medals. Bernanke gets medals. Yellen gets medals. Pa Powell's going to get medals. I point out, the ridiculousness of these people. 
And I think, and no one does that. And I think people like are like, wow. Hey, you know what? I can back it up too. They are ridiculous people. I mean, Yellen with her speeches to people she formerly was supposed to regulate. The fact that Bernanke went to Citadel and PIMCO, among other places, is just mind blowing to me. I mean, that talk about regulatory capture. It's disgusting. And then Yellen boomerangs back after her speech income. Now she's, you know, as Treasury Secretary, bow, you know, on mushrooms, bowing to Z. So, you know, it's, I do, I, I, one, of the, one, one of my funnier times was when a guy blocked me and he posted, and somehow I, you know, I can find it, that I was, he said I was the second worst Fentwood account. I think he meant Zero Hedge was probably the first, but he says, but at least the sociopath behind Rudy Havenstein is, has a sense of humor. So, and I remember the guy and the guy's a money manager. And a lot of people that block me are money managers or people in the business. And this particular guy got mad because he gave the standard, well, without Ben Bernanke, you know, the world would have ended and we all would have died. And I, I replied, I said, are you kidding me? We, without Ben Bernanke, we probably wouldn't have had the, you know, the situation, you know, or certainly who's patient zero. And so that's the kind of thing. He was like, are you saying Ben Bernanke's not a hero? I mean, to me, to him, it was like, Oh my God, because all of his friends, Bernanke's a hero. You know, you know, all the people I, I hang out with at the private club in New York or, you know, Bernanke's a hero. Of course he is because he saved you. But I'm more familiar with the people who, you know, he didn't save. And, and in fact, he's an arsonist, you know, same thing with Yellen and, and Powell. You know, they're arsonists and then they come in and they try and put out a fire and everyone like applauds and gives them a award. It's bizarre to me. And it's so obvious to me. And, and people for years are like, well, you know, why are rates low? Why are rates low? You know, oh, we have the savings glut and we have the, uh, you know, Summers had a theory and also I'm like, guys, you guys bought the, like $31 trillion of bonds, the, the central banks around the world. <laughs> that has a big effect. They said, no, that's, that has nothing to do with rates being low. You know, I'm like, it's just insane. You know, it's things that are obvious to me. And I think obvious to most people, if they have even a rudimentary understanding of what's going on, it's like, oh yeah, but that's not what you hear. You're not going to hear that from Scott Wapner and Leesman and Tima Rose and all. You know, what is Timur Rose doing? He's writing books glorifying the Fed. Same thing as Hilsenrath. He wrote a book. He called it a love story about Jana Yellen. You know, Gianna Smilek, it was she at the time. She wrote a book about how awesome the Fed is. So all we're getting from our financial media is propaganda. I mean, they loved SBF until, oops, he's a fraud. I mean, there's a great video of CNBC hosts. All they're doing talking like he's the second coming. And, and there's no repercussions. There's no accountability. That's another thing. No accountability anywhere for any of these people. From Bernanke, Bernan you get promoted. You know, and that that's irritating. I think it's not just irritating to me, it's irritating to a lot of people when they, that are aware of it. Yeah, I, I always reference that 60 Minutes interview that Ben Bernanke did in early 2009, where he was asked the question of, you know, how confident are you that you can oh. fix inflation, right? We can read rates in 15 minutes. It's like, all right, well, that's- I'll you're, read it right now. It's, I have that. I have a lot of history here, folks. And I back up my, I have the, as I texted the other day. So yeah, it's a problem because they say things and then they, the opposite happens and there's never any accountability. Congress doesn't care. All congressmen want is for their, their fund coupons to be directed their way. You know, there's no Ron Paul anymore. Sanders is a wall. He used to help Ron Paul once in a blue moon, but so there's nobody really in Congress that challenges these guys. The only way they challenge them, well, you know, can you like lower rates to zero again? So my, you know, the big corporations in my district are happy and can do stock buyback. I don't know if it's a more fun note, but I'm just a more of a curiosity note for me. How many times have has Twitter or X <laughs> suspended your account? Well, one day, probably 10 times or dozen times, but for permanently, I think it's been four times. The last one was three months and it's permanent, like death penalty. And one, one time I had an inter, a guy who knew a guy intervene. And another time, I think a few days later, without explanation, I was back. And then two other times, the last one was under Elon. It's really hasn't from when Jack was running things. It's, and I, you know, I don't think Jack's the worst guy, but he, you know, so I haven't seen a big in Twitter, frankly. Uh, there's still some great people I follow for years who are suspended right now. And without explanation. And so I don't know what's going on. I mean, I'm not, a, you know, I'm a huge free speech advocate, but I don't feel like that's necessarily what's really going on here. Well, actually, that's actually, a, that's a good direction maybe for the last few minutes, which is, it, it, based on what you just said, it doesn't sound like you believe necessarily that Elon Musk's kind of portrayal of this is all about a town square and free speech and defending free speech. That's uh, exactly accurate. It's another thing that is common nowadays. You know, he was a darling of the left when he was making green cars. And then now that he's, I guess, made, you know, right wing comments, he's the darling of the right. I don't know that. There, I mean, the guy is a major defense contractor. He's trying to turn Twitter into a Chinese WhatsApp, right? So, you know, I think Whitney Webb has said, you know, she's not going to be on the site very much longer if you start having to send your DNA and fingerprints and all that in. 
And I certainly don't want to be putting your financial stuff tied to Twitter or something. It's just, it's just a, it's a nice little toy, but you don't want to have your life wrapped around it because everything seems to be on a whim here too. So it's just, and part of a, a broader thing, like I said, I don't think free speech is a major concern on Twitter. I mean, it, it might be with Elon with certain people that he likes, but like I said, I know plenty of like minor people who are totally cool people that are, that are banned. And, and that's, and it's, I hear it's much worse on and YouTube, but that's, it's a low bar. I'm, I think block and mute work fine. If anyone has a problem with me, just block me. You know, I may be miffed for, you know, but for a minute, but I don't care. And I block people, I block the sea lions, the guys that can't let something go. They want to chat with you like, okay, drop every now and read this and then, and then get back to me. And yeah, it's like, you know, come on, dude, I got a hundred thousand people. I started with zero. So if you're out there with, a, with two followers, don't get discouraged. But I would suggest do a funny, entertaining, you know, cause I always try to make it entertaining. And a lot of times when I post, you know, a lot of the data I post, it's meant to shock people like, Hey, wake up. This is what's going on. But then I like, oh, I don't want people to be bummed out. So I put a funny video. In fact, that's what gets me banned half the time is funny. You know, I put some music in a video and, and Sony music comes after me. So anyway, just having fun. Speaking of music, I, I have seen your notes on, on Substack on, on some of these different tracks. That you, it's like great. I just saw, I think it was late last night, maybe you were having a drink or two and you were just like riffing on different uh, songs that you liked. Uh, do you find of a, a therapeutic way of dealing with <laughs> the shit of inflation? Oh yeah. I just like, I always love music. And so I, you know, I put, I put songs out and sometimes there's a reason and sometimes there's just no reason. That's just a lyrical pop in my head. A lot of times someone will say something on TV or someone will text me something and I'll phrase it. And I'm like, oh, I know that song, you know, or something. And I just, so I'll just post that song, you know, and there's certain songs that have particular meaning. And, and, and I think in the t context of what I'm trying to do, but uh, no, nah, I just like music and I like all kinds of music, all, you know, wide of the genres. You had said earlier, oftentimes those that block you are money managers. I have not blocked you and I don't intend. To. I hear you I, block a lot of people though. And you block I, people I that really like, I block people that like it. Because, you know, what I, I do the very purpose of because if somebody, you can never know somebody, not even, yeah. you can't even know somebody fully in real life, right? Yeah, but online, right. it talks about much more. But my point is that, you know, if somebody's reposting things which are snarky, that yeah. gives me a little bit of insight in terms of who they are. And I don't want them to follow me. I don't want to have anything to do with, do with them. So I block them, right? I mean, that's, that, maybe I'm aggressive with that, but I don't know any other way to have some consequence in a world where people are used to having no consequences, right? I mean, that's- Yeah, I, I mute if like someone sends me something like, you know, there's some weird people out there. So usually I'll mute. If someone's really over the top, I'll, I'll block them. I, I like, like there's, like I was saying, I have a lot of people, I follow a lot of people on the left and the right and, and the middle. And I have no, you know, I'll see, tweets from people that I respect on and that I completely bug me and disagree with, but you know, I don't get into it with them because I'm like, you know what? I like the guy on the other issues. I'd rather find common ground and not burn bridges with people. I think we need a lot more of that in this country, left and right. I mean, I'm, I know people on the left are anti-war and there's people on the right that are anti-war and people in the middle. I mean, let's unite on that and not worry if we disagree on, you know, this other topic or that topic. Let's agree with, you know, something as major as that. And if you look at my pinned tweet, it, it's warmongers and it's the banks, the kleptocrats, as I call them. And so if, if I find a guy like Robert F. Kennedy, he's right on my top two issues. Is he right on all my other hundred issues? You'd mostly know probably, yes or no. I don't know. I mean, he's got a lot of issues himself, but, but he's right on my top two issues. And that's rare. You know, that's very rare. You know, Ron Paul, Dennis Kucinich, Tulsi Gabbard, had a, I kind of liked last time. Do I agree with everything she's for? No. I mean, I quote Elizabeth Warren, like I said, but I disagree with her probably on the vast majority of her positions now, or a lot of them, you know, I, but common ground is important. We need to find that. We need to not like just write people off completely because we disagree with them on half the issues or something because the other half are important too. I could not agree more with that. It's like, even if you don't like the vast majority of what somebody says, there's still, there's always a little gold nugget, right? It's, right. it's always worth listening to everybody, right? And, right. and it's hard for people to understand that the best thing to do is, is view things from the standpoint of your own vil filter rather than just shutting out, you know, what's coming at you, right? I think that's kind right. Of yeah, a lot of people live in an echo chamber and that's not good. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Rudy, for those who want to follow you, obviously here on X they can, but uh, you mentioned the Substack. What's the Substack link? It's rudy.substack.com. So it's easy to remember. And I don't call it X, I call it Twitter and I always will call it Twitter. So I made a joke. I was going to start blocking people that call it X, but I'm I'm, it was a joke. Well, then I'm fucked. So <laughs> no, you're all right. I mean, I haven't been blocked by you yet, so I guess that's a good sign. And, uh, and for whatever it's worth, you know, I, 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 I don't know you in person, but yeah, I appreciate the positive uh, engagement. You've listened to several of these podcasts I do sure. in the past, and you're always uh, kind with that. So everyone, please make sure you follow uh, Rudy on Twitter. 
not on X. Subscribe to Substack as well. And really, I appreciate uh, you doing this. Sorry for the slight technical difficulties at the start here. But again, folks, this will be podcast under Lead Lag Live in a couple of days here. Thank you, Rudy. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you.